the three, two, one countdown. <laughs> what happened? Okay. Oh, we're live. <laughs> greetings, 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 and welcome to Hill Time Tuesdays. This is Lisa. It's so good to be here with you, isn't it? We are live and in the flesh. In the flesh. <laughs> I can touch her. She can touch me. And uh, well, you know what? This is what life is all about. When we are dealt with something, pick it up, make light out of it, and enjoy the process. For those of you who are just tuning in, welcome. We're a bit late and not on purpose. We've been live, but we didn't know we're not live. Anyhow. Uh, this is Lisa Bubari. Welcome to Heal Talk, Real Talk with Lisa. By trade, I'm a clinical hypnotherapist uh, and the owner and founder of Heal Within, a healing center in Glendale. Hello, Henry. It's so good for, to have you. I was wondering how come no one is showing <laughs> up on my feed. My guest today is Mel Mason, the author of a book called Freedom from Clutter. And we met because of Forbes Riley, mm -hmm. and uh, Forbes has brought so many people together. Um, and a few months ago, I drove to Palm Desert to meet with her, and it has become a perfect uh, friendship. Yes. yes. <laughs> so today I'm interviewing you because of, I, I read the book, and I love it because you talk about clutter and how to be free of that. Um, you, you talked about fear, you talked about trauma in the past, you talked about so much. Uh, please tell us why is it that so many hold on to stuff and there are people who hoard it and they can't let go. You have step-by-step -step process, but before that, tell us uh, a little bit of your story. I know you were born in Massachusetts and... Uh, you've had a very difficult time, but how did you come to unclutter? Yeah, I'd be happy to. Thanks so much for having me, Lisa. So for those of you that don't know any of my story, I was one of those kids who was completely cluttered and disorganized. My entire floor was covered. My mother would just shut the door. There were two paths on the floor in my room, one from the door to my desk and one from the door to my bed. That's And only I could see those paths. Nobody else could see them. That was just in my head. It was that cluttered. And I mean, it was trash. It was stuff. It was everything. And then my idea of cleaning was shoving everything under the bed and in the closet. And quite frankly, at that point in my life, I didn't care about my environment. I was completely fine living that way. I had no idea that there was anything wrong with that or not wrong with it, but that anything not normal with that or not okay with that. I was completely comfortable living in that in that environment. And I also experienced a lot of trauma and loss growing up. I was a victim of sexual abuse. I was a victim of emotional abuse. My parents separated when I was four years old. And by the time I was 15 years old, I lost my older brother to suicide. And in losing him to suicide, I was actually the one who discovered his body. Mm. And when I discovered his body, along with that was a suicide note on the table, which then left all of his belongings to me, a 15 year old. So after having to deal with his death and tell my father that his son had committed suicide, I then had to look at everything in his house and decide what I was going to keep, what other people could have, what I was going to let go of. And as you can imagine, being 15 years old and going That's a through burden. That, yeah, that's so, a heavy mm -hmm. burden on a child. Yeah. And I know some people consider 15, I'm adult, I can take care of that. And yet you were having your own trauma and things that you were dealing with. Now you have to take care of this. Yeah. And so at that point in my life, I mean, everything was already dark for me already. I was already mm -hmm. depressed. I was already doing drugs. I was already in a mess. I had already been locked up in jail as a kid in juvenile hall. Like I was just already not on a good path. And so when that happened, it kind of was almost like the nail in my coffin and just spun me into this downward spiral where I got kicked out of my high school for being a danger to myself and others. And I was told that I couldn't come back until I got intensive therapy. And I went, I had to go live in a residential treatment center for adolescents for the next year and a half of my life. And while I was living there, one of the most magical things 
that ever happened in my life happened there. And for me, that was being introduced to yoga and mindfulness. And I didn't know it at the time that that was going to be the most magical thing because <clears throat> it was just something that I was introduced to and I, I really took a liking to and I loved doing yoga and I started meditating on a regular basis. But what was magical about it was what started to happen is I went from someone who was totally fine living in this chaotic environment, could live in all this clutter, was completely disorganized, to someone who had to start having clear space in my life. I spontaneously started to look at the things that had been accumulating in my life and the mess that I had created, and I started clearing it. I started letting go of the things that had accumulated in my physical environment. Did you do it on your own, or did you have someone helping you, guiding you? supporting you through this because in your book you say you did it and yet you were still taking drugs yeah so, so i did it on my own like the the spontaneousness came from right. the practice but i also had those demons that i was still struggling mm. with as i was getting through the clutter i was still struggling with drug and alcohol addiction and all that i was already a crack addict at 17 and doing crystal meth and all that at 20. so for <laughs> clients and our viewers that are viewing here and they have teenagers that are depressed that are doing drugs what goes on when when i don't understand it so can you share how can one do yoga and mindfulness and yet do the drug so where is that dichotomy does it make you feel good and yet you're in a disarray because your life is in a disarray. Yeah, I mean, it's a gradual process. Like you have all this clutter accumulate over so much time, all this stuff that I call inner clutter, the repressed emotions, the resentments, mm. the fears and the limiting beliefs from all the trauma and loss that as you learn how to start to be present with it, it doesn't all just go away and all the symptoms go away. You don't just stop doing what you're doing, but it everything happens gradually, little by little. So. I started to care more about my physical environment and started to make changes in that. And then my drug addiction started to be to weigh on me to where it started to be something that I didn't want to be doing anymore. Mm. Whereas before I was in a place where I was praying that every hit that I took would stop my heart. So I went from being in a place of not caring about living or dying and wanting to die every hit that I took to this is not what I want to be doing, but I just can't seem to get off of this stuff yet. And it was such a so struggle. there is an internal struggle. I want to get off of it. I just don't know how to get out of this. Mm -hmm. Okay. And even with being in 12 step programs and even knowing all of that stuff, there's still that struggle that goes on. And I wasn't able to overcome it for years later. I mean, it was an ongoing struggle for years. So is it an emotional thing or is it a mental? Because working with our subconscious when i work with my clients tapping into the subconscious and like changing a habit like smoking or overeating and craving sugars is there is not only working with the subconscious mind but there are stops there are like a support system for my clients to get on that when you have steps in your book helping our audience maybe someone you know that is a hoarder maybe someone you know that uh, likes to keep things sentimental from grandma from mom my uh, you know it took mom a while even <clears throat> our neighbor and her husband died for 10 years she didn't touch the closet mm -hmm. because she wanted to feel as if he, his presence because of so much love right why is it so hard for people to let go yeah absolutely i mean letting go is a muscle that you have to build over mm. time you don't you don't go from being someone who's really attached to things and hanging on to just being willing to let go it's just not possible it's a muscle that we have to build over time and you do that by periodically going through your stuff and letting go of what's easy and then you let go of the things that are harder and harder and harder but like I had this class that I took in, in college. I didn't actually go to college. I just audited this college course, uh, Symbolic Logic, and absolutely fell in love with the course and kept everything. Like I was so attached to the coursework, to the work from the teacher, to all my work. I kept it in this purple little binder and I kept it in my desk drawer. Never did I look at it and do anything with it except for when it was time to move and I had to pack it. 
and I would take it out and I would look at it and I would have this feeling of attachment and I just couldn't let it go. Well, the great thing about attachment is you don't need to know why. We don't mm. need to know why. The why doesn't matter. The why does not matter. It's just the energy of attachment. So, and it's just acknowledging the attachment and allowing it to be there, like not forcing yourself either. You'll let go of it when you're ready and it will happen naturally little by little. And so after years of looking at it, packing it, moving it, unpacking it and doing that over and over again and continuing to let go of other things in my life, I finally got to a point where I was willing to let go of some of it. So I let go of my written work and I kept the teacher's work. And mm. then the next time I went through it, I finally let go of it all. But it took me probably, I want to say, five or six years before I was willing to let it all go. You were not letting it go because of the sentimental value? Or did you think that, you know, one day I'm going to go and read that again because it will be important there's imp important information in there that i may need again it was just that i loved the class so much i was attached ah. to it. it was just an energy of attachment and there was no logical reason why it wasn't a yeah. logical like it wasn't there it wasn't this logical reason why i just there was this energy of attachment i loved the class i i wanted to do it again i wanted to still know the information but i never did anything with it there was just this energy of attachment and i wasn't ready to let it go and so what I want to say to you is that you will let go of what you're ready to let go of when you're ready to let go of it. But the most important thing is that you consistently make time to start looking at the stuff that's accumulated in your life. And as you do, <clears throat> and you become willing to look at it, you'll let go of 30 to 60% without trying. That will be the easy stuff. And then as you start letting go, you're building that muscle. You're going to the gym and you're doing those reps so that right. when you get to the harder stuff, it will be easier to let go of. So you'll go through something one time and you'll be really stuck on some stuff. Then the next time you go through it, you'll let go of a little bit more and a little bit more. So I've heard <laughs> that you can do piles. One pile, I'm gonna hold on to for now. One pile, I'm ready to pay it forward, give it to <clears throat> someone like Salvation Army or to a thrift store or the Goodwill, right? And there is one that I can literally dump it, delete it, and let it go. So by doing this, it becomes easier. It's not like, okay, we're here to do a garage sale. Because even people, when they're doing a garage sale, it's like someone comes to buy it and they go, oh, no, 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 you know what? I still want to hold on to that little pen that my someone gave to me because it's still sentimental. And then they lose the pen. And it's like, oh my God, where is that pen? So it's probably a penny, but it doesn't matter. Hi, Forbes. It's so good to have you. Hi, Sedajan. Hi, Elvira. Um, so what are the things that truly matter? There, you talked about trauma. You talked about fear. Go ahead and say, what are the three significant things that may create symbolically, internally, emotionally, subconsciously, that makes us hold on to stuff? For me personally, it was, it was four things. It was repressed emotions from traumas and losses. It's resentments that we hang on to. Right. It's the fears that we take on. And then all the limiting beliefs that we get from our family and our life as we're growing up because they don't come with instruction manuals. So they impart their limiting beliefs onto us as we're growing up. And growing up as youngsters, we really look up to them. Not that it's always their fault. It's how we perceive because a child's view of what they see is not what is reality, but it's their perception becomes their reality. Um, how did you start on drugs? Mm. Well, I started really young. Right. I first started with alcohol, uh, but I think I remember... Uh, my mom and my stepdad would drink at friends' house and I would always, you know, they'd ask me to get them a drink and I would always like take a bunch of sips. But the first buzz that I ever got, I wound up at a neighbor's house. I don't even know how this happened. I'm in at the table with a bunch of adults and this bottle of peppermint schnapps, super schnapps, 101, is going around the table and they let it come to this 10-year-old. 
And I don't know what it is, but I just take a big old shot. And they said it was like a three finger shot. And that was the first time that I ever got that warm glow mm. going in my body and just feeling that feeling warm good. glow from my fingers to my toes. And I was already, you know, had experienced a lot of trauma and loss. So that just kind of just set me on fire. And by the time I was 13 years old, my brother introduced me to LSD. And that was the first drug I ever tried. I actually did LSD before I ever smoked pot or did anything else. And once I tried LSD for the first time, it was like, oh, I really like this. I just kind of came home in my body for the first time. And I wanted to recreate that high for as long as I could. And that was my introduction to drugs and alcohol. And it just kind of took off from there, (laughs) which it's a hard thing to realize um, that domestic abuse is from people you know. Um, As I hear the addiction that started you on that path to the negative downward spiral started because of your brother. Mm -hmm. So be aware for parents whose teenagers And they say, you know, you can't go out with that person or that person. I don't like you. Be aware of your own household, Mm -hmm. Um, the cousins and long distance family members. Uh, I want to say something to that really quickly because it's very interesting because Because this is real talk. Yeah, this is not about what is only for the outside for our viewers. It's real talk of what our life is because we're not perfect as you see mel is sharing her thing please go ahead and say that yeah absolutely so for me my brother was was first of all my brother was my stepbrother and we didn't actually get to live together he wound up being in and out of foster homes but he experienced a lot of abuse as well so he then imparted that onto me so Mm. he was someone i idolized but he was also the person who sexually molested me and then he was the person who gave me drugs to deal with that so he was the person who traumatized me and then gave me all of the drugs to help me numb the pain and to learn how to cope in that way. And then he was the one who took his life and left everything to me to deal with. So in a way, I just got goosebumps. Um, It's like he had so much hurt in him Mm -hmm. that you were the closest person and he loved you and he inflicted his hurt right and shared it with you yeah. it's like uh abusing the light mm-hmm. and that's the only thing he knew i mean that's the only thing he knew that's how he knew how to share love because he was also abused as well right. he was abandoned into foster homes he was sexually molested in foster homes he was given drugs and alcohol so he did the same exact thing I get, I, I'm sorry, I just got emotional about it because of my nonprofit, which is for motherless children. <clears throat> we want to make sure that through the after school programs and everything that we do, we help those children uh, become healthier, understand, and if they are doing anything self destructive or anything negative for them to start the healing of the burdens of the pain of the trauma and realizing that there are no limitations that each one we are children of god and when there is hurt the hurt has to find the closest person that it's love and light and they come to hurt them because um how has this book what are the steps that our viewers can take if they want to let go of one thing and they go and open their closet and we're not talking about the garage yet and everything i've got clothes that i hold on to uh, because they still fit me and i love them and they're probably 10 15 years old and even if i don't fit in it i say i'm going to lose the weight two more pounds and I can zip it up. We call those gold clothes. Those are gold clothes. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Yeah, I'd be happy to. So first and foremost is my rule of thumb is always one square foot by one square foot. You start small. You don't tackle the whole closet. You don't tackle the whole garage all at once. 
you start super small and pick one little area, whether it's a shelf, whether it's a junk drawer, whether it's the, the top of your nightstand, but you start small. Okay. And then the tendency for most people is to take everything off the nightstand or out of the box or whatever it is they're working on and dump it in a big pile in front of them. That to me is an absolute no-no. That just causes more overwhelm Chaos. right from the beginning. But a lot of people do that. They'll rip out the entire closet and put it on their bed. And then they start trying to make decisions about what Talk about they're trying because you can't do it. Like they're trying because they can't do it. it. They have all this stuff on their bed and they get really overwhelmed. So my what I have my clients do is you first sort into general categories. So pick a little area that you're going to work on and sort into super general categories. I like to do it as a rule of thumb by room, whether one it's drawer a drawer at a time. Well, you say, yeah, one drawer at a time and sort. Like you're taking one item out of the drawer at a time and sorting it into super general categories. I like to go by rooms. Like it's for the bedroom, it's for the garage, it's for the kitchen, it's for the bathroom, it's for the office. And just sort super generally. Once you get it sorted, you have an empty box or an empty drawer, and then you have everything out in orderly piles around you, which two things happen here. If you got tired or you got interrupted, something happened with the kids and you needed to go do something, you don't have to throw it all back and make it worse than when it was when you started. You can just contain each pile and put it away neatly and come back later. But the other thing about this is that it allows you to get a visual of what you mm -hmm. have. And when you have that visual, it's easier for you to decide what you're going to let go of and what you, you're going to keep. So if you see you've got 20 of this shirt and 10 of this, it's like, oh, I can let go of a couple of these. Maybe. I can, maybe, but it makes it easier rather than one at a time and there's 10 more under the pile here somewhere, but you don't know that you have them. When you have that visual, it makes it easier. So start small and sort into general categories before you make any decisions. And so my rule of thumb here is as you're sorting, you're not allowed to decide what you're keeping and what you're letting go of. You're just supposed to sort like a robot. Okay. Here's the reason why though. Got it. It's no emotions. It's it, well, the reason why is you don't want to wind up with decision fatigue. And right now you're deciding what category something belongs to. So that's a decision all in itself. And a lot of people struggle with that. You'll be surprised that a lot of people have a hard time deciding what category something is for them. Then later you have to decide whether you're going to keep it or you're going to let it go. So you don't want to combine those two decision-making processes or you just put yourself into decision fatigue and then you wind up getting overwhelmed and just saying, F it. So start small, sort into general categories, no decision-making. The only thing that you can let go of in that moment is if it's literally a piece of trash, you don't have to sort trash. You can put it in the trash. Got it. But sort everything first before you start making your decisions. And if, when you get overwhelmed, call me. <laughs> uh, but that will take the overwhelm out of the whole process. Right. It just does. It becomes like strategic. Yeah. I mean, I had a client call me and she couldn't even look at her garage. And I taught her this simple step-by-step -step process. And she was able to get through an entire garage and then go through her entire house. Okay. Just because it just, it was a simplified process that took the overwhelm out of it. It was like, oh, okay, this is super simple. I just sort and then I make the decisions and it makes it that much easier. So let's talk about another part. Um, people who are my age and have an elderly and seniors and elderly like to hold on to things because it's been part of their life and it's sentimental to them and i'm not even talking my age but she's talking about her stuff though. i know i'm talking <laughs> about my stuff mom <laughs> has a hard time letting go of things mm -hmm. right but here's one thing we started it was so beautiful that mom had all these pictures like black and white or even pictures in an album. And the, I mean, the pictures, the colors were fading away and you hardly ever go and look of her time when <clears throat> they were married or something like that. So what she did was beautiful. She sat down when I was not home and she went through each album and kept only 10% of the pictures awesome. that are meaningful yep. and everything else that it was about her life and my dad's life that my dad has, uh, he died about four years ago, that I would not even know who are those people in those pictures right. and said, even if I kept it, if anything happens to you, you're going to tear it up and just dump it anyhow. 
So by going through them, she reminisced. Yep. She remembered. She did her own healing by going through the timeline. Yep. And she tore them up. And the albums that were just like falling apart was gone. Mm -hmm. So out of like 30 albums, now she's got five and a bag of pictures. And she said, go through them. And if you don't want it, then we can toss them. I haven't had time to go through them. But if it is about family, we kept. And anything that had to do with mom or dad's work, it was all gone. Mm -hmm her mind in her mind she said you're not going to need it and you're just going to pick it and dump it right so let me so, save the work for you exactly <laughs> is that something that also you would consider healing oh beautifully absolutely yeah, isn't That's, it? i love that it just totally touches my heart that right. she did that it's because so many people wind up not being aware of what their stuff is going to do to their family when they go so just yeah. to even have that awareness and be willing to go through it so that you didn't have that to go through and just think ahead. That's beautiful. That's, I love that. Right. But then there's parts in the garage that we can't touch. It's okay. But <laughs> like I said, it's a, it's a it's muscle. A process. It's a muscle. So that's great. She went through what she was able to go through and right. then she goes through a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. So a part of the book um, is uh, the conscious efforts recognizing it and how I work with my clients is evoking what was a part of the history um the reasons that we started yours was the connection of yours and your brothers and by doing is it possible that while you were doing drugs even though you didn't realize it in a way you kept that closeness or that connection to your brother? Oh, I'm sure. Absolutely. I mean, that was that was how we related. That's why I continued to do LSD for so many years and do any kind of hallucinogenic drug because it was him that introduced me to that. So absolutely. Most 100%. And you're sober, mm -hmm. clean. Yeah. Um, how can you help someone else? Because... Uh, someone uh, i admire who's made an incredible recovery of his phone uh, of his own joe polish um he says you cannot shift addiction with uh punishment no mm -mm. it's only with love yeah i mean i was looking at six years in prison over my head that wasn't that wasn't enough to it, ha it took me finally getting to a place where I actually loved myself enough to want to not kill myself anymore. And how can we love ourselves enough to be able to let go? For me, it was what I what I boil everything down to is my my signature technique that I work with my clients. It's called allowing the now. And it's simply just learning how to be in this non-judgmental, loving space with yourself because we spend so much time avoiding mm. what's uncomfortable in our lives or clinging to what feels good and never simply just allowing the moment, whether we be, whether we're feeling sad or we're feeling happy or we're feeling resentful or our mind is racing all over the place. We're never just present with it. We're yeah. always trying to change it and do something about it instead of just sitting with it. And so it's the learning. avoidance. Yeah. So it's learning and all clutter accumulates because we avoid it. Right. So it's literally just learning how to be present in your body in the moment for yourself in this non judgmental loving space without trying to change anything, without fixing anything, without doing anything different, but simply meeting yourself exactly where you are. Because the truth of the matter is, it's kind of like GPS. GPS doesn't need to know where the hell you've been all your life doesn't need to know your history. It needs to know where you stand right now and where you want to go to get exactly. you there. So it's you being willing to meet yourself right here and right now without judging yourself, without beating yourself up and without changing anything and just in total love and acceptance. And from that space is, and from that place is where you start to make the space inside. The moment that you can just be non-judgmental and loving with yourself for just a moment, 
you create that space inside, which then starts to translate outside. And the more that you do it, the more space you make inside, the more space that has to happen outside because it is a law. It is the principle of correspondence. As above, so below. Uh -huh. As within, so without. So it is absolutely law. I can guarantee your life will radically transform if you start becoming, spending five minutes a day just allowing the now. Where <clears throat> it's the same thing I usually say, embrace the here and the now, yeah. the embrace the reality. <clears throat> So embracing yourself and even if you or someone you know that they don't know how to love themselves, it's easier to say, I choose to be kinder. I choose to be kind today. How can I be kinder today? Only for today. And then one day at a time. Yep. Just like one square at a time. Yeah, one moment at a time. Sometimes it's just a moment. That's it. I'm just going to be kind in this moment, and then the next moment, and then the next moment. I'm just not going to judge myself. I'm just not going to beat myself up. It's like one of the first things my clients want to tell me is like what they didn't do oh. between our sessions. I'm like, I don't care what you didn't do. We're going to just focus on the here and now and what exactly. what were the wins? What What did you accomplish? What was, you know, we're not going to beat yourself up and focus on any of that. No punishment. No no, no, only love and non-judgmental awareness. Beautiful. Uh, how can they find this book? They can find this book on Amazon.com. Just Google Freedom from Clutter in a little search bar and it'll pop up. You can buy it on Amazon. Beautiful. And uh, what if uh, my audience wants to connect with you? Would you like to offer something? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I, I would love to. Thank you so Putting much. Her on the spot. <laughs> well, for all of Lisa's listeners out there, what I would love to do for you is I just really love connecting with you and really helping you get a plan in place and get you moving in the direction of getting free from your clutter in every area of your life. So what I'd like to do for your audience today, if it's okay with you, is sure. normally I, I, I don't actually offer private coaching sessions. You have to coach with me for a year to get this. And it's a it's a almost a four hundred dollar value. So what I'd like to do is offer your audience a free a freedom from clutter coaching call with me at no cost. Yes. So all you have to do is email me at info at decluttingspaces.com or if we're friends on Facebook, you can find me on Lisa's page. You can send me a message through Facebook Messenger as well. Or they can friend you. Yeah, that too. <laughs> <laughs> so um, is there any questions? Good idea. Oh, I got to let go of stuff, but so true. The more you clean, the more it makes you feel good. Remember, I remember when I was married, this is like oozums years <laughs> ago. I talk about it because I, I believe the more you express, you release a lot of things. Uh, I would wake up at two o'clock in the morning or two 30 in the morning where I could not sleep, go downstairs and literally start scrubbing mm. the bathroom tub or the bathroom and by doing so it's like releasing so mm. much mm -hmm. um, and there is that is the work that needs to be done not needs to it is good because there's things that we hold on to subconsciously without realizing like thursday I'm having a Zoom session for stop smoking. And for those of you or someone you know that is a smoker or has an inkling of knowing how to change a habit or how to become a non-smoker because it can happen in one session, although I believe it is a lifestyle change, um, please click below, sign up, and we're doing a two-hour Zoom on Thursday and all the information is right there. It's on my website, also healwithin.com. Uh, we have, I think it says, we cleaned out the tech box over the weekend. We kept two of each kind of wire in case of something <laughs> breaks. We have a backup. All the others went to trash. Awesome. There you go. Talk about M Mrs. Geek. Geek. <laughs> and she's got <clears throat> all kinds, I mean, computers and uh, all kinds of you talk about keyboards. She's got, well, I already have nine of them and they're not even a <laughs> distributor. So good job. Is awesome. there any questions? Hi, Sherry. How What's are up, you? Sherry? <laughs> uh, Vera, how's it going? Oh, and I just love that you said um, to be a non-smoker because mm -hmm. when I, when I, 
quit smoking because I used to be a smoker too. I was smoking a pack a day since I was 13 years old. I had, I had a mentor tell me that when I woke up the next morning, not to think that I quit smoking, but to change the way that I thought and to say that I'm a non-smoker Correct. and shifting that awareness and shifting that perspective. I woke up as a non-smoker and I didn't have cravings. It was the strangest thing. What I did is I, I needed something to hit my lungs. I had that. It wasn't even so much something to do with the hands, but it was something hitting my lungs. So I cut straws the size of cigarettes and I sucked on straws for a couple of days, That's but there was no craving to have a cigarette or anything like that. I mean, there is now today, but I don't smoke anymore, but the craving comes now. It's so funny. But when I actually quit and changed the mindset, that changed everything. So I love that you said non-smoker. Of course. And uh, as adults, we definitely do not want to be a quitter. No, 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 no. So That's what I used stop. to say about drug addiction. I don't want to be a quitter. I'm not going to quit go. doing See? drugs. That's why you could never quit doing drugs. I'm not a quitter. I'm not a quitter. <laughs> Show me a way and I'll tell you no. Even prison didn't make me quit. So punishment does not work. Mm-hmm. Kindness, love, grace, support is what helps us move forward in life. I think there is a lot that we we can even do together to help mm-hmm. our clients. Yeah. It's... um. If there is no question, what is, do you see? Mm-hmm. Yep. All right. Uh, by all means, uh, we are open. Would you take any questions right now? If we see questions, yeah, by all means, let's uh, bring on any questions, any thoughts, ideas, concept, images, bring it on. And in closing, I want to know, what do you do for fun? Oh, my favorite thing to do is I love to hike and bike in triple do- triple digit temperatures in the desert so when it was 48 she says it's freezing i said can't even when it's like 60 it's freezing <laughs> right <laughs> give me my triple digits back this 98 is like a tease i go out hiking and i'm it, it's it's like a frog boiling in water it takes forever to get do you hot. have to do everything to the extreme no i just like the heat <laughs> if you can't take the heat get out of the kitchen right right get out of my kitchen and then i get the trail do you like myself. jacuzzi Oh, I love the jacuzzi. I push myself to stay in it for an hour. I bring my electrolytes. An hour? Yeah, I bring my electrolytes and my regular water, and I time myself. And I sit in there so long that by the time I get out, my spine Is sweats for hours. Is it healthy to stay in a jacuzzi for an hour? Well, they say they don't want you to wind up with heat stroke, but I right. push my body to test my body to get exactly to that point. I get it to the point, like, right where I'm feeling the chills, and then I get out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Jeez. Hey, I just like the heat. I'm from the cold temperature, so anything hot, I love. If I get cold, forget it. Like, my hands are freezing right now. (laughs) And I don't like cold. (laughs) Okay, we are not six feet apart. (laughs) I know. But I tested negative the other day, so you're good. (laughs) Okay. I did my citizen duty. What is your favorite book outside of your Mm. book? My favorite book that absolutely changed my life and just sent me on it just opened my mind it just sent me on the path spiritually was the miracle of mindfulness from Thich Nhat Hanh. oh that is my absolute favorite book that just turned my life around and just sent me it was the answer to everything because at that point in my life i had been brought up christian and i was a beaming light in the christian church evangelizing and i had people basically tell me that my brother was burning in hell because he committed suicide And so that really, really shook my world and questioned my faith. And I was introduced to the miracle of mindfulness while I was living in that residential treatment center. So I was introduced to mindfulness, yoga, meditation. And that book just, I became a sponge. I just went and read everything that I possibly could. I studied every different kind of religion and philosophy. And Buddhism has been at the core of my being ever since. And so you do meditation, you do yoga, you do hikes, you love the heat. And the book. Um, and I don't own a TV. I don't watch TV. She does not watch TV. I'm very careful what I consume with my mind. How do we let go of toxic relationships? The more and more you make space in yourself, the more that you'll let go of those people in your life that no longer serve you. But it really, everything comes from allowing the now. From this one place, everything will change. It started with the physical clutter in my life. 
then it went to the drugs and alcohol, then it went to my diet. Uh, three years ago, I went vegetarian, then a year ago, I went vegan. It, you, I didn't exercise regularly years ago. Now I hike and I bike all the time. I'm hiking every day. You know, everything starts to change. And then finally, I let go of a 12 year toxic marriage. But it took a long time to do that. Yes. It comes from, I like to call it self pride, self love, and mm -hmm. self kindness. And with that, um, I thank you for being here, for driving <laughs> all the way to LA. And uh, in closing, would you please complete this sentence? Mel is. Mel is unconditionally loving and can hold amazing space for you. Thank you. I love you. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> love you guys. Thank you. Uh, for those of you who are still interested in signing up for the Stop Smoking, please do so. Visit our website, healwithin.com. And until next week, God bless you and may the universal light surround you. Bye-bye. Thank you for being here. If you want to check out some of the testimonials that I've got, click right here. But if you want to go back and watch other videos from a week ago, two weeks ago, even a year ago, click right here. See you next time.